Welcome everyone to the December 4th Addiction Toxicology Case Conference. I'm Tim Wiegand and we're presenting on behalf of the American College of Medical Toxicology, the American Society of Addiction Medicine and the Opioid Response Network. Uh, this uh, activity is uh, available for one uh, credit of uh, AMA um, Category 1 uh, CME. Um, the objectives today are to describe the appropriate use of drug testing and the treatment of patients with substance use disorders during the COVID-19 pandemic, to describe what specimen validity testing includes for urine and oral fluid testing, and to review cases of testing results in clinical cases of addiction medicine. And finally, to provide guidance and resources for the treatment of substance use disorders and addiction as cases of COVID-19 increase dramatically across the nation. I'm Tim Wiegand, the Director of Toxicology at the University of Rochester Medical Center and Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine. Uh, my co-moderator is Dr. Glory Bashevitz, the Medical Director of Strong Recovery and Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Rochester. And as our panelists, we have Dr. Lewis Nelson, who is the Professor and Chair of Emergency Medicine at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, Newark, New Jersey. Dr. Kara Poland, Assistant Professor, College of Human Medicine, Michigan State University, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Dr. Ross Sullivan, Director of Medical Toxicology at the Upstate University Hospital. He's also the Director of the Upstate University Medicine Opioid Bridge Clinic and Medical Director of Helio Health in Syracuse, New York. None of our speakers have any conflicts of interest. And I'm going to jump right in with the first case. Uh, please keep um, questions and comments for the panelists and moderators uh, in the Q&A, and uh, the chat can be reserved for um, just chatting amongst uh, oneself. So the first case we have is slate of hand during buprenorphine administration, combining drug testing, observed dosing, and telehealth to support a challenging patient during COVID-19. This case involves a 26-year-old female with a history of opioid use disorder who reconnects with an outpatient treatment program. She had disengaged two months prior due to frustration over a CPS report related to intoxication and overdose with a young child in the home. And it is now mid to late October, New York, 2020. The COVID pandemic is just starting to really increase and we're worried about travel, obviously. She'd originally been enrolled in the same program three different times, first in 2019 for eight months, two separate episodes, and then in 2020 from February 2020 until about July 2020 and then the disengagement for two months, two to three months, and uh, re-engagement. She reports use of 90 to 180 milligrams of oxycodone per day via intranasal use. She describes them as perks, but these really are the oxycodone 30 milligram tablets. There's also tobacco use, but no other prescribed medications, alcohol, or illicit substances. At the intake visit, the day after leaving detox in 2019, she has a urine drug screen obtained. The detox admit was seven days, and she'd been using oxycodone or the perks prior to entering detox facility, but denied other substances. Uh, the intake urine screen demonstrated oxycodone plus fentanyl at the detox. While in detox, she started on buprenorphine naloxone and then stabilized on an eight milligram dose of buprenorphine or an eight size two twice a day. The image you see are the results from the outpatient intake uh, with confirmation, the confirmatory results related to just the benzodiazepine uh, positivity. And my question for the panelists is, what does the what do the benzodiazepine results indicate? And then I'll start with uh, Dr. Nelson. Um, what do these results tell you about uh, this patient? Uh, hi, everybody. It's Lewis Nelson in um, in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I mean, the simplest explanation would be that the person uh, took diazepam. I mean, they have the metabolites of diazepam, um, all present, nor diazepam uh, and temazepam are, I think, direct metabolites, and oxazepam is an ultimate metabolite. And the one we usually actually screen for when we screen for benzodiazepines alone. But this is obviously a much more comprehensive look at benzodiazepines. Sure, thank you. I suppose it's possible that this patient could have had diazepam, temazepam, and then oxazepam, Oxazepam is Cirax and Temazepam is Restoril. I really don't see those too commonly prescribed. I'm not sure what your experience is. Do you see either the, the separate Temazepam and Oxazepam prescribed? Well, I, sometimes we'll see Oxazepam prescribed for patients with alcohol withdrawal as an outpatient treatment. Um, 
I mean, temazepam restoril used to be used, I think, pretty widely as a, as a sleep aid, but I think most now use um, one of the Z drugs in place of the benzodiazepine. I mean, it's certainly, those are very reasonable explanations. I, I was just giving the simplest explanation, which is taking one drug and getting all the metabolites. Um, obviously, nordiazepam is not a drug, so she would have had to take presumably diazepam to get that at the very least. And, and you, you are correct with that. This is part of the protocol. Um, diazepam would be part of the protocol of this particular detox. Dr. Sullivan, can you maybe comment a little bit on if this patient's coming into a detox for opioid use disorder to potentially either detox or initiate buprenorphine, what kind of protocol would um, be common? Well, you know, obviously the most common protocol is to, you know, um, recruit people onto buprenorphine as soon as possible. Um, and with people of varying degrees of um, taking care of these people, you know, some people are comfortable giving bup with people with cow scores of eight, sometimes 12, but certainly with um, how uh, prevalent fentanyl is, um, we have seen maybe a slight increase of some um, people with some precipitated withdrawals at lower cow scores. Um, so it's not uncommon um, to have a protocol, even like where we do, where I work here in the middle of Syracuse, where someone may have a good degree of anxiety um, so it's not uncommon to maybe give somebody some diazepam uh, while we're waiting to get the person ultimately onto buprenorphine. Um, some people come fully in withdrawal and ready to start, and some people just use before they walked in, but still are understandably anxious. Um, so it's not uncommon to give um, doses of, buprenorphine, uh, excuse me, of diazepam um, while they're waiting to be started on their uh, buprenorphine. Sure. And this protocol of a small dose of diazepam, the buprenorphine when appropriate, some clonidine and hydroxazine, and then for sleep melatonin, there's a couple of other comfort medications. But this is a this is a diazepam metabolite profile for benzodiazepines. Let's move on to the next slide, which um, are the buprenorphine results at, at the uh, intake. And um, I'm wondering what um, these uh, would suggest. Um, and then if, if uh, the panelists can com comment at least on buprenorphine metabolism and any experience regarding profile use to determine compliance and guide treatment. Uh, Dr. Poland, do you have any thoughts? Thank you, Kara Poland from Michigan State University in Grand Rapids. Um, so when you, so when, one thing that we sometimes are concerned about is misusing or diverting the medication and not actually taking it yourself. Um, that's where the norbuprenorphine comes in because that's a metabolite of the buprenorphine. So if there is a concern of the person not taking the buprenorphine themselves and maybe putting that tablet, that strip um, or rubbing that strip with the swab for the oral cavity or put, dropping a piece of a strip into their urine, they those individuals wouldn't have norbuprenorphine. So when you're concerned about diversion or there might be, a, or you're just are generally monitoring patients for diversion, uh, that norbuprenorphine becomes very, very helpful there. Uh, the naloxone in there is at a pretty high level. So that implies that just prior to coming to detox, perhaps this person um, had overdosed and was in the emergency room. And that was the kind of the sentinel event to get them um, engaged in treatment. Uh, that, some, that sometimes is a, is a point of contact for us as healthcare um, and being very aware that this individual does look like they uh, likely had a recent overdose and finding out what the circumstances of that in a kind, compassionate way were and making sure that um, you're aware that this individual may be a higher risk individual from a substance use disorder um, and potential risk for overdose death if not continued on treatment post detox um, is, is something to be aware of because as as we often say, detox is the beginning of treatment. It is not treatment itself. And we're still working um, sometimes against others in the healthcare community, but certainly in the community-based uh, settings where people think that when somebody, after somebody goes to detox, they should, no long, they, they should be cured. Yeah, some great points. Um, Dr. Bashevitz, do you have anything you'd like to add? How do you, do you use the metabolite profiles in your uh, treatment? Dr. Sorry. Yeah, I was muted. 
Now, uh, mainly we look for a, a good uh, amount of presence of the norbuprenorphine and a lesser amount of uh, buprenorphine uh, to uh, make sure that the patient is not uh, sprinkling uh, buprenorphine on their urine. Uh, there are many, many people who still try to do that. Uh, and uh, that, that's mainly um, what it is, yeah. Yeah, so th this is interesting. And, and actually, the, when it's referred to in this uh, result, the buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine are total. So not just um, buprenorphine, it's a buprenorphine and the conjugate buprenorphine glucuronide. The naloxone result is a bit odd. That is quite high for someone taking sublingually, but the, the metabolites are, are present, and this patient had come right out of detox. Just to go over buprenorphine metabolism, in general, somebody takes buprenorphine, it is conjugated with uh, glucuronic acid, and it's also demethylated to norbuprenorphine. And then those two metabolites, the, the main metabolites, just some other minor ones, are then um, either conjugated again, if it's norbuprenorphine to norbuprenorphine glucuronide, and or demethylated from glucose to norbuprenorphine. So you result in this end norbuprenorphine glucuronide. Most labs look at the norbuprenorphine to creatinine ratio that will fluctuate a little bit over time if somebody's on a stable dose, depending on how a patient takes it. Are they taking a meds with a dry mouth? Uh, are they taking it now running to work? That's a shorter drive, so it's five minutes versus at home, 15 minutes. And so there is a lot of variability that's just kind of normally built in to how someone takes their dose. But um, you can use these metabolite profiles to, to kind of guide therapy in um, uh, in general, and this is not certainly an absolute, except when you see the, as Dr. Poland mentioned, um, a spike, and we'll take a look at what that looks like in just a little bit. So well, let's take uh, a. Tim, uh, we have ahead. a couple of questions here uh, uh, in sure. the question box, uh, and uh, one of them is uh, an interesting one. Could naloxone uh, at that level that we see in the result? Uh, also be due to swallowing rather than permitting the buprenorphine naloxone product to be sublingually absorbed? I think that's a great question. And that's, you know, my explanation. Um, again, it's not as well absorbed uh, as, um, well, it's not absorbed to a significant extent. We don't see patients with um, withdrawal typically even swallowing buprenorphine. We do use naloxone occasionally off-label in the hospital for constipation and works entirely, but um, you know, those levels were pretty high even for swallowing, but um, you know, some absorption does occur certainly. Um, yeah, Dr. I, Nelson, do you have any? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's less bioavailable by mouth than it is you know, transmucosally because it's pretty much eliminated by first pass for the most part. And that, that's one of the reasons you can give it orally. Um, for constipation, if it can in, it can interact with the receptors in the GI tract, but it won't really produce much else. But one of the things that I know, I mean, we don't really measure quantitative urine naloxone levels much, but but it's certainly been studied, you know. And 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 the reason it's been studied in part is because there are people who get the buprenorphine combination and state that they withdraw, right, and state that they actually feel like they're having. Um, even given properly that they're having the, um, uh, you know, a, a mild spiritual due to the naloxone. And so when people have studied this, they do show there's a very large variability among people and the, and the naloxone levels that they wind up getting, even after the same dose among a group of people. So, I mean, while 1200 is definitely high, um, <clears throat> I, and there is the explanation that Kara gave is, is perfectly legitimate. Um, it's possible perhaps that this person could have taken it the right way and just be one of those folks who either <clears throat> absorbs more or metabolizes less. It is also possible that the person um, misused buprenorphine naloxone and injected that sure. as well. Yeah, yeah, there's other explanations, sure. Yeah, but I do think that if you want to say it, it's a tough one because I don't think we really studied the use of you know, the naloxone levels from a therapeutic perspective and only from a you know, research venue. Right. Yeah, that's a good point about the injection as well. Um, I can say in clinical settings where I've uh, transitioned patients that have been on buprenorphine to the dual product, I, when it's done appropriately, um, the tolerance of the dual product is, is the same as the mono product. I very rarely see people in, in, intolerant of um, the naloxone um, and, um, in general. So let's move on. So the, the, um, the next slide involves... Uh, uh, 
oxycodone metabolites and we see some fentanyl and this is again the same day the, the day after detox and she says she found a perk when she got home the night prior uh, she reported she insufflated it but it didn't work because of the suboxins are in me for deep from detox is what, what her words were so what do the results here tell you about that perk set or perk if um, she that was all she used uh, dr sullivan Well, it does uh, seem that she used oxycodone. I mean, one thing I always think about where we live in probably most places is, um, is it, is there a counterfeit with something else? And, um, you know, or is there something else in it? A lot of times people take pills here and they end up being other things. We see a lot with people who use uh, Zanny bars and it ends up being fentanyl. Um, and this certainly could be the same thing here. We do have some uh, urine fentanyl and um, urine norfentanyl. I can't remember exactly when this is in relation to when she first came into detox. I know that I think we said maybe there was some fentanyl use then, um, but assuming that that was some degree of time, this is some degree of time afterwards, um, you know, I would be concerned that there perhaps there was some fentanyl lacing um, in this oxycodone. Um, conversely, she could have just used fentanyl at some time previous to this and just not letting us know. What about the oxycodone uh, profile? Is that a typical, are all of those uh, oxycodone, oxymorphone, or oxycodone just simply from oxycodone, uh, Dr. Nelson? Um, that's, again, th that's Occam's razor, right? That's the simplest explanation. Certainly oxymorphone is, is available as a, as a medication um, that's Opana, um, but I would probably imagine that the best explanation would be they took oxycodone. Right. Any other thoughts on this um, profile, Dr. Poland? I don't think so. I think everybody covered covered things nicely. I mean, it could also be that um, you know what her the Percocet that she found at home was one that was created on the illicit market and has fentanyl in it because they. They do manufacture on the illicit market pills that are made to look just like the pharmaceutical grade. So I wonder if there was an illicit component of what she thought she was taking. Yeah, I, you know, my interpretation of this is, is uh, as Dr. Nelson said, Occam's razor, the, the most simple explanation is she had an adulterated oxycodone um, pill, but she could have had oxycodone or oxymorphone with oxycodone and fentanyl and, or heroin that was just fentanyl with some oxycodone and oxymorphone, but most likely she just took oxycodone adulterated with fentanyl. And, um, you know, this slide just indicates the increasing prevalence of counterfeit pills. This is a, a photo from the DEA uh, site with um, uh, counterfeit 30 milligram tablets that contained fentanyl. Um, other uh, classes of medication are also um, counterfeited. Um, we had a session on uh, designer drugs a couple of months ago and discussed the increasing prevalence of counterfeit alprazolam, illicit alprazolam, which contains mostly flu alprazolam, currently historically etizolam. Uh, some of the benzodiazepine pills have also been found to contain fentanyl. Um, and then fentanyl has also made its way into the uh, illicit stimulant supply, uh, fluctuates by uh, parts of the country, parts of the world. Um, in, um, you know, in upstate New York, we have outbreaks with cocaine, adulterated fentanyl, and we have a lot of overdoses and it ebbs and flows. But in um, other parts of the country, I know that there's much higher rates of fentanyl adulteration and stimulants. Um, but uh, adulteration of the prescription pills and particularly the highly sought after oxycodone and alprazolam is very common. So the following results are obtained two weeks after the detox discharge. Now she's in outpatient treatment and she reports occasional slip ups, but she says she's regularly taking the buprenorphine naloxone. And so now how do these results compare to the results two weeks prior, which were the day after detox? And um, Dr. Bishevitz, do you want to comment? So, we're comparing this to the day after detox. Okay, so there is um, less uh, amount of uh, benzodiazepines in her urine. There's only uh, 
oxazepam instead of um, uh, there being three benzos uh, listed. And that could be because um, it, it could still be from the diazepam uh, that she possibly took as a treatment uh, uh, in, uh, in the past, though it's, it's getting a little farther out. It's, it's two weeks, so I'd, I'd expect it to be out by now, but uh, you never know with uh, diazepam. I suppose it's possible. Um, I, of course, she's still using um, either fentanyl directly or fentanyl altered, uh, fentanyl added to some other uh, drug of abuse, uh, such as uh, pills or uh, possibly uh, heroin, though we see no uh, heroin metabolites here, uh, just the, uh, the same pattern that we already saw. So, um, you know, I would say that uh, she's not using much buprenorphine, uh, because the norbuprenorphine to creatinine ratio is uh, very, very small. And uh, I'm assuming uh, the way this is uh, reported on the slide here, I'm assuming the buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine um, levels were actually zero. Is that is that correct? No, I just didn't in include them as they weren't standardized to creatinine. So she did have some buprenorphine um, and lower naloxone levels. Just to compare the day after the norbuprenorphine creatinine was 15, over 1500. So she's at less than a 10th of that. Um, and then compared to the fentanyl, she had very small levels of fentanyl and I think 15 nanograms per milliliter of norfentanyl. Um, the oxycodone metabolites are about the same. So, um, so yeah, your, your comments are, are on, right on. Dr. Sullivan, do you have any other thoughts with comments regarding this? And it just seems that she's, you know, using, you know, the last drug screen we have, it seems like she's using that same type of drug pattern or use, maybe a little bit more now. You know, we see the oxycodone and its metabolites uh, being persistently high, and the fentanyls, uh, norfentanyl also appear to be higher. So it's possible she's using more larger amounts of this, um, perhaps um, street or counterfeit uh, oxycodone. Um, yeah, she's been sick doing what she was doing the last time we drug screened her, but maybe even more so now. Right. And oxazepam is the final metabolite of diazepam. If somebody's given several doses through a detox, we can see the, the metabolite weeks out. So a positive amino acid screen, um, you know, would be pretty common and important if you're really worried about ongoing benzodiazepine use to really determine what does that mean? Because, you know, if a patient gets diazepam, in a detox facility in three, even four weeks out longer, if they have a lot of lipid, they um, can continue to be positive. So, but this is, is making me a bit worried. Uh, she has some buprenorphine in her, in her which is somewhat, somewhat protective. Rarely do we see fatal overdoses with buprenorphine present. And there are cases, but um, you know, really large amounts of synthetic opioids, which she clearly has. She's using you know, fentanyl and oxycodone, whether it's adulterated oxycodone or or separate, it, it's getting concerning. So this would make me concerned. We'd bring her in for some absorbed doses, maybe consider the sub the uh, subcutaneous buprenorphine, but um, you know, use these to really in get, try to engage and to express concern and support. Um, so here's there's another question here uh, from the questions. Uh, uh, what is exactly the value of the buprenorphine to uh, creatinine ratio? So the buprenorphine separately from the norbuprenorphine isn't something I look at unless it is a free buprenorphine. And if it's total, that means it's combined with the conjugate. And I don't find that very useful, although some will look at various levels of the different conjugates to suggest the timing. Did somebody recently take their buprenorphine or not? But I find that the metabolite norbuprenorphine and only if you are able to isolate the buprenorphine itself, which could be very, very, very low to almost not present at the threshold of detection if somebody's appropriately taking buprenorphine. And we can go over that a little bit later. We've got some slides that highlight the usefulness of that, I think, further down um, in the case discussion. So um, in 2019, she had these two separate episodes of treatment, some disengagement. She was regularly prescribed 60 milligrams of buprenorphine Attempted to get the subcutaneous buprenorphine, but the, the process, if you're familiar with it, involves ordering, and then the patient needs to give consent um, to have the um, medication uh, shipped. 
to the pharmacy and um, she didn't complete the consent. Um, so just looking at these results in general, there's a lot of fluctuation um, in um, how she's taking the medication. So she's coming off and on and, and um, there's wide variability, which would really serve to drive uh, discussion and support for her. I've included on this next slide a comparison of the oxycodone results. And you can see in general, when there's really low levels of metabolites, she's got really high levels of oxycodone. And I don't have the fentanyl as well, but in general, there was mostly what she was getting was uh, oxycodone adulterated with um, fentanyl. Um, so you can see how potentially useful the levels are in, in terms of interpreting, um, you know, risk and, and patterns of, of use. So um, the patient ultimately had disengaged uh, despite um, attempts to use peers, uh, on-site visits, uh, counseling, um, a mix of group versus individual, really trying to, to try and check to her um, uh, preference. She re-engages in February 2020, and she reports the same level of opioid use. And an intake urine drug screen is positive for oxycodone and fentanyl. She started on buprenorphine naloxone via an observed dose on-site induction right in early March. Um, the urine screen results from that visit are included below. The patient was not prescribed buprenorphine in the interval from leaving 2019, which is the end of 2019, to re-engaging with the first prescription the morning of induction. What do the results below suggest that she was using prior to the induction, Dr. Poland? Do you have some thoughts? Sure, yes, it is. It does look like she was using at least relatively recently. Those levels are are pretty significant. Um, doesn't seem like those, those would be trending down um, of any sort, but it sure seems like she was using prior to the induction and just making sure that you're looking at that individual clinically because the numbers don't really tell you what a, a point at which you can start giving buprenorphine. Um, you really need to, because different people have different tolerances, you really need to look at that individual clinically. Most commonly that's done using the cow scale, the clinical opioid withdrawal scale. There is also a self-administered version of that if people are doing home inductions. Um, which which are become which are becoming more uh, more common and, and more utilized, um, but I would I would say you need to, you really the numbers don't tell me anything definitively other than this patient is still in the appears to be an active use. I can't tell if they've cut back. I can't tell if they're in withdrawal. But those are all things that we would potentially want to want to observe clinically and, and have that discussion with the patient about when they last used and 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 what that impact might be on timing for induction. Sure, and actually she was using illicit buprenorphine, which is the, this, the norbuprenorphine and creatinine. It's pretty high coming in, um, you know, not as high as when she left the detox with all doses observed, but um, she told us she uh, had been taking street buprenorphine, in fact, brought one in um, and uh, took it in front of us and, and um, you know, didn't appear to be in withdrawal. So she, despite having the oxycodone in her system, um, she was able to do the induction. So buprenorphine and oxycodone were all that was seen. There was no fentanyl on this time, so she must have just gotten it simply in oxycodone. I know the buprenorphine is higher and, um, you know, the oxycodone lower, not the greater than 6,000. And so she probably restarted the buprenorphine a day or two prior, or maybe had been taking a little bit more. Um, and it may have been a couple of days, you know, as Dr. Poland had mentioned, since the oxycodone use. Although it's, it's, not, it's difficult to, to say specifically, it really depends on how much and, and um, you know, she'd been using and, and um, some other factors. So now we're in March and the COVID pandemic is impacting addiction treatment fairly dramatically, and, and um, you know, we've got a looming storm on the horizon. Um, so my question to the group is, what types of changes would have occurred that would have impacted a patient with this history? So, you know, we've, we have someone who struggled to be engaged, and, and um, you know, what types of changes to, to treatment in March um, would have been uh, at play that really would have affected this patient's care? Uh, Dr. Sullivan. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that some of the things that happened in, you know, March and April end up kind of changing again later on as, you know, um, things change and access to, you know, PPEs and other things alter. But, you know, early on, I know here in central New York and New York State, um, we ended up having an abrupt stopping of uh, outpatient 
um, services uh, where they no longer, you know, were on site. And, you know, some places may have been uh, lucky or nimble enough to already have robust telemedicine services, say, in place. Um, and although we rapidly increased those, we were not one of those places day one. So, you know, um, access to just, you know, immediate, uh, you know, care, you know, 24 seven care, which we do offer most places do now, um, we were unable to at that moment in time, probably provide it as good as we should have, um, or, or as good a, not, or as well as we are now, I should say. So just um, access to, um, to care and probably very for a short time, even access to buprenorphine may have been impacted. Um, although, as we know, different laws ended up coming out, which um, alleviated some of the constraints of prescribing um, buprenorphine. But during this exact period of time, for at least a week, two, three weeks, there may have been some difficulty in providing um, the best, you know, the care that this patient needed um, due to the very beginning of the of the pandemic. Right. I mean, in just a, a dramatic drops in uh, on-site visits, depending on you know, what type of treatment program, um, increased prescription duration, um, less drug testing to really none at, to start. Um, some programs were, like you said, very quick to uh, include telemedicine and up and running. Um, and then the regulatory changes that occurred uh, thanks to advocacy efforts from um, many um, professional groups and others. It was um, ACMG, ASAM, AAAP, the um, many different um, groups is important. Um, yeah, so the on-site visits for this person, this patient were really critical doing observed doses. And even with that, it, she was not as reliable taking the buprenorphine. So I'm very worried about um, you know, her uh, ability to stay engaged. Dr. Beshevitz, do, do you have any other comments regarding changes that may have impacted this patient with this history or in general with the onset of COVID in early March, at least with the clinical impact in New York State in particular? Well, I, th I think in, in New York State, uh, what we saw mostly was that uh, we were asked by our um, uh, regulatory body, uh, New York State Oasis, to uh, decrease uh, the amounts of uh, uh, visits and decrease urine testing. Uh, a lot of uh, people uh, who work in the field became, uh, you know, uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable with that, but uh, we had to talk about the public health benefits of reducing contact and try and follow the science as, as things were going on. And of course, now we're in another spike and we're asking people to follow science again and to uh, decrease um, um, testing and, and visits. Uh, and uh, uh, we also asked uh, counselors to try and keep patients in uh, in the program and not discharge them, uh, just to be essentially to be more harm reduction oriented. Um, I have a couple of uh, interesting questions uh, in the question box, though. Uh, sure. And uh, one of them, if we're ready for those, uh, Tim, you sure. Go ahead. Um, so it, there's there's quite a few questions, and I, I don't know that we would get to all of them, but one of the themes here is basically uh, this person is using a lot of opiate related drugs, and uh, all of the, m most of the slides seem to say that she's been getting 16 milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone uh, per day. Um, why uh, would we not think she needs more than 16 milligrams? Why not just raise her? Is what the the slides or the uh, question is saying. So that's a great point. Um, the key, though, is that she's not taking the 16 milligrams. Um, and, you know, as you saw when she came out of detox at the much higher levels, um, and whether buprenorphine is even the right medication for the patient, she had been offered what isn't included. She had been offered to um, stabilize in an inpatient setting. Um, I declined doing that because she had young children. Um, uh, consider methadone um, and to consider the subcutaneous buprenorphine and, um, you know, if she had still had craving um, after a series of observed doses or confirmation that she's taking the buprenorphine, we, we do increase the dose. And, um, you know, but the reliability and, you know, the dropping of levels every time um, there was 
uh, you know, missed appointments and, you know, suggested that she just wasn't taking the buprenorphine, which was really the primary issue. But yes, you raise a good point. If there's a patient that's taking 16 milligrams and still has craving, uh, increasing to 24, or looking at, you know, other options such as subcutaneous um, administration or, or methadone would be the, the option. Yeah. Uh, I, so go ahead. No, I, I agree with that. And, and uh, I, I think essentially uh, we, the way we conceptualize this is uh, we didn't have a handle on her yet. Uh, she wasn't uh, cooperating with treatment enough to get from point A to point B yet. Uh, and we needed to consider other possibilities like other medicines or other levels of care as well. And basically we weren't there yet for numerous reasons, part of which was her refusal for other levels of care. Right. Yeah, Tim. So, um, Dr. What, yes, uh, go ahead. So, so one, of the, one of the kind of silver linings that we saw with a few weeks after the initiation of, of the pandemic was the liberalization of buprenorphine prescribing um, in terms of dosing and <clears throat> duration of dosing and things like that. And we know from at least sort of street sources that the price of buprenorphine on the street dropped pretty dramatically. And so people were able to actually access buprenorphine. I was told in my town, it went from about $8 per milligram strip to about $1, right? We, and, and there was just a plethora of drug on the street. Now, it, it sounds like a nice story when you hear that and people were having easy access to harm reduction through these buprenorphine. But I don't know if everybody saw it today in, in Chama Psych, there was a piece that looked at um, deaths from, from overdose, presumably opioid overdose, um, during the pandemic, and they clearly spiked and went way up. Um, so whether they would have been even worse if we didn't have this extra buprenorphine or whether this kind of story about having extra buprenorphine on the, extra bup on the street doesn't really mean anything is a little bit unknown. But she maybe had access, you would say, to some illicit buprenorphine based on her urine level, and maybe that's where she got it from. Yeah. No, and she clearly, when she wasn't engaged, was using some illicit buprenorphine. And even with the fluctuation of the level, she was continued on the 16 milligrams just with attempts to get her to take it. Um, I did see increasing overdoses in patients, and I have seen at the best continues to see uh, overdoses of, of patients that are supposed to be taking buprenorphine, but with the less monitoring and checking in, um, are just not doing well um, and frequent in and out of detox with um, current prescriptions not taking. So I think that there are, there's a population that with the less monitoring, it, it's um, hard for them to take the buprenorphine. So looking at other options, I've, I've seen many fatal overdoses. I think that needs to be teased out as we look at the data from um, you know, the increases overall, what, what has been the role of um, you know, the monitoring and more liberalization of buprenorphine. One thing that we did have in our area that I didn't mention was pharmacies um, started delivering um, medications and um, a lot of our patients had uh, tr trouble with lost prescription. Um, with with um, at certain points, some of the uh, r um, riots uh, related to social injustice and racial um, injustice and um, George Floyd um, had um, resulted in parts of town having um, damage and some pharmacies being closed. And so we really had to be nimble despite, um, you know, having a skeleton crew on site and less contact at least directly with patients because even at the pharmacy level, there were problems and early on even stocking and being able to be flexible. So um, some dramatic... I think you're bringing up, I think bringing up some of the social concerns that have happened over this, uh, the year of 2020 is really important in this. And that, you know, as, as we've looked at COVID and what we are recommending for our society is social isolation, right? And we've known for decades now, the work of Bruce Alexander and the Rat Park studies, um, that isolation is a marker for worsening substance use. So as we interpret some of this information, is it what, how, what contribution do these external forces have on our patients? What contribution does it isolate, that social isolation has that had on our, on our communities and on our individual patients? I mean, I don't, I don't require all of my patients to go to AA or, or frankly be in any kind of therapy because there, there hasn't been uh, 
concrete evidence that therapy is a necessity um, for, for all patients, but certainly the majority of my patients, all of my patients are at least offered it, but the, for the ones that, have, that take that up, that whole landscape has drastically changed in that, in that human connectedness, right? That three-dimensional being in the same room, we all are getting Zoom fatigue, right? We're all, we're all experiencing this as our patients are, and what contribution has that social isolation had, which we know already pre-COVID, contributes to substance use, has that clouded the benefits of, of some of this telehealth and some of these changes that we've made in other spaces. I, I don't know that we'd be able to tease that out, but I think before we draw any conclusions about, about, this, about this time that we need to be sensitive to that. Sure. Certainly some people have done really well with the access to Zoom. I've had patients that have enjoyed participating in AA or NA or other meetings internationally, um, even in the hospital setting as they've been hospitalized related to complications from their substance use or you know, at home, but others just simply that is not a model that um, works well for them. They need the human contact and our use of the peers um, to go into the community, to meet people where they're at has really been limited to dramatically, in particular during the, you know, the surges. Um, there have been guidance. I want to highlight um, you know, the ASAM guidance um, related to COVID, which is um, updated and had um, uh, created a series of um, topics in particular related to uh, all levels of care of addiction uh, medicine. Um, one of the features today, uh, obviously, is drug testing, and um, uh, ASIM had um, put together a, a evidence-based um, uh, expert panel um, uh, supported paper on uh, drug testing, clinical addiction medicine that several of us were involved in, Dr. Nelson um, and uh, myself, and. Um, the adjustment of drug testing protocols has been one of the most downloaded documents from the ASAM website. So people clearly looking for guidance on this area with um, COVID-19, among other things um, as well. So let's move ahead with this patient. The patient's prescriptions are increased to biweekly with on-site check-in uh, from weekly prescriptions pre-COVID. Uh, this is most of those as well. Uh, she's spread of contact, agrees to try the subcutaneous buprenorphine, which is ordered. She completes the consent process delivered, but she disengages as the medication arrives, and ultimately the order has to be wasted for the waste protocol. And during this past several phone calls with the counselors and the providers, she was slurring speech, sounded extremely intoxicated, and a welfare check was requested, and she's found intoxicated with a young child on site, resulting in a CPS case referral. Uh, she disengages after this, but did call back again in October, there were some delays with the CPS plan. Um, as I think all level of social services have been um, uh, thin because of um, you know, a lot of factors um, pertaining mostly to COVID. And she wants to restart buprenorphine and get back on track and medication. So at this point in October, what are your thoughts for this patient? She refused detox and in inpatient. And apparently the CPS case, will, they will not re enforce this unless she's not engaging now with this next chance at outpatient mm -hmm. or they failing, what's called, and um, I wouldn't use that word, but um, that was the specific terminology. So um, any thoughts, Dr. Bishevitz? So this one is uh, kind of like a catch-22, especially with all the uh, COVID-19 concerns. And uh, basically, um, you face the challenge of maybe saying no to her and saying, no, um, I'm not going to give you uh, any kind of uh, buprenorphine or sublocade now because uh, I really think you need some higher level of care, such as uh, inpatient or methadone maintenance. Uh, and I, I know that um, you know people have all sorts of feelings about that in, in terms of um, um, the COVID uh, epidemic and a, a call for more harm reduction. But sometimes, especially when you've talked with the patients so much and there have been so many uh, difficult uh, episodes in treatment that uh, she hasn't got through, um, you know, you, you might think of just telling her that a higher level of care is needed and uh, see what she does. 
Right. I, I agree. I, I think it's uncommon from my practice that I will not prescribe and try again, but I have had a patient recently that with each prescription of buprenorphine is overdosed, not on the buprenorphine, but on, you know, after a binge, right after getting the prescription. And so, you know, clearly the situation offered, if it stabilizes an inpatient, but not just simply through remote prescription and not if observed doses. So um, we did try to do um, reinduction, wanted to do one, one last try. One, one last try. Um, she scheduled for an onsite induction due to prior episodes of not taking. Um, we have had high risk patients on site as well as the inductions and bringing in occasionally for drug testing, still less frequently. Some dipstick, if it's thought to be important, some CPS cases that have requested um, confirmation that they're doing well. Um, it's important for their social situation. So we've opened up some on-site visits, but um, really the groups and uh, most counseling will occur outside. Um, still a skeleton crew on site. And it, the um, intake coordinator reports she sounded off when calling and patient admitted she'd been using again the day she called. She said she thinks it's fentanyl, um, not actually perks. At the on-site induction, the patient takes an eight milligram film appropriately. She brought one of her own again, um, and she agrees to a telehealth visit two nights after. And this is via an, an app, there's several, Zoom, Doxy.me. Uh, prescription for eight milligram, eight days is sent to the pharmacy. Counseling, group sessions, and peer contact via telehealth are set up. Um, and um, so we move forward. Uh, so this is the results from her induction on the, in October. Um, she's low norbuprenorphine to creatinine, so she's using a little bit of illicit um, buprenorphine and no oxycodone. Um, it's just uh, fentanyl, high levels of, of fentanyl. So these are essentially, if she's using adulterated oxycodone, they're really um, just fentanyl um, and filler. So I'm question, Dr. Sullivan, what platforms and mechanisms are providers using for telehealth evaluations for group uh, uh, physician or advanced provider evaluations, MAT initiation or follow visits, are there any particular novel telehealth support methods that um, other, others have found uh, for patients? Um, I think the two most common that I've been using are the Zoom platform and the doxy.me. I know there's a number of other approved platforms. Just um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, in terms of platforms, you know, we've used those, we've used Zoom, we've used, you know, Microsoft Teams. I mean, I think there's quite a few different positives and negatives to each one of them. Um, um, you know, some of them, you know, allow people to use any type of internet connection um, and they can cl click a link. There's a, there's a lot of different platforms out there right now. I think that, you know, the biggest thing, you know, that, you know, we think is, you know, does telehealth work for certain situations? And we know that telehealth does work and that patients do like it. Um, but what's interesting is that we really now have a dichotomy of telephone versus video now. And, you know, it's a question of does telephones, is it just as good as video? And some of these questions are still being answered. Um, we did do a self-study here that we're looking to maybe um, try to publish that showed though that in terms of in the height of COVID here and then through the summer, what we found was is that engagement with primarily phone for MAT visits was about the same pre-COVID and then during COVID when we went to telephone. Um, and the same thing held true for individual and therapy appointments, um, that people were still remaining connected with their therapists and counselors. But what was interesting was that trying to conduct groups over a video, which has a lot of different problems and uh, you know HIPAA type things and laws, but even um, using voice groups, we found that the uh, participation in those dropped precipitously trying to use what we do every day for meetings. Now that might just be something here in local, but you know maybe it's hard to do a group with 10, 15 people just over a telephone group chat. Um, maybe even um, things like groups over video, where, you know, where we have a lot of people who don't have the capability of doing video. So all these things have to really be um, you know taken into account when you think about what works um, for your patients. I will note that the patient we're talking about here, you know, we're saying, well, our patient's not working for, but in some ways, just talking to her on the phone and having a good peer support is kind of working for her. We're keeping her engaged. Um, we know that she's having some periods of being altered and lethargic, maybe with some other drugs or alcohol. And, you know, maybe she'd be doing better. I use this word quotations. Maybe um, if we had a formal outpatient for her, but just using telephone with a good peer structure in some ways, though, is still supporting her to getting back on 
some medication. So um, I do want to say that telephone, you know, maybe not be the best, but does I think have some uh, efficacy during uh, COVID right now. Yeah, those are great comments. I think I, I agree when I have regular contact via phone, if that's the only mechanism and I see that they've had consistent attendance and sound good and, um, you know, are, are making their appointments, it's it typically, um, I'm not as concerned. And even when we've brought patients in for confirmation, it, it, you know, that validates my, um, you know, thoughts. So um, just moving ahead, the patient um, has a scheduled um, observed dose and she answers a call notifying her of the telehealth appointment but doesn't log into the waiting room for despite two more calls for over 20 minutes when she finally does she's in a dress she has makeup on is in a dark room not at home she quickly takes what looks to be the buprenorphine film the protocol for the telehealth calls are re reviewed with her and um, you know, that you know to be available and um, have the medication ready we call ahead and do the telehealth if it's a video call um, and um, she's scheduled for an on-site visit and um, for a urine and observed dose um, because of concerns. Um, we also discuss ordering the subcutaneous buprenorphine again, although with her on and off regularity, we really want to confirm that she's actually taking the buprenorphine to get the shot. She's never gotten the shot, um, but are considering even if we can get a couple of days that we know that she's taking it, she's going to be able to get the shot if she agrees. Um, at the on-site visit, the patient's anxious. is an open wrapper. She explains it because she thought she could do the observed dose with a front desk administrator. The urine screen is obtained, and the dip demonstrates only buprenorphine, and it's sent for confirmation. Normally, don't do the, the dips, but I wanted to make sure she had at least some in. Um, and so I'm going to jump ahead from protocol for on-site visits during current COVID-19 surge, and we can talk a little bit about after we um, talk about what um, occurred at her visit. Uh, as the patient does the observed dose, the provider doesn't see the film going into her mouth and asks to see it under the tongue. When she does show the film, it's clearly wrapped in plastic, not just a normal film. And she pulls out a piece of buprenorphine naloxone film, not a complete piece, wrapped in plastic. And she says, I forgot to take the wrap off. The guy in the waiting room outside, the patient actually was outside of the building, had um, been in earlier, gave it to me to use, to use to cover it up after I couldn't do the dose with the lady up front. Um, so I'm wondering, what would you do in this situation, uh, Dr. Uh, Beshevitz? Would you have her unwrap and take it? or? Um... I, I would try and inspect it to see if I thought it looked like a regular, um, a regular film. Uh, that, that would be number one. And I would think that uh, she's very, very creative in, in what she's saying here. Yeah. So I, I did... We did take a look at it, and it was buprenorphine wrapped in plastic. And um, she's advised of the risks related to taking it if she's not taking buprenorphine and using other opioids, and that being precipitated withdrawal, or not taking it at all, which I didn't, didn't think she's taking any opioids because she's either taking oxycodone fentanyl or buprenorphine. And she does take it, but swallows it quickly. And we do an oral swab after the sublingual administration. Couldn't find the oral swab, not doing a lot of those on site, and the patient is anxious about this as we're doing the oral swab. She's counseled regarding the testing, observed doses, goals of care, simply want to have her healthy on the appropriate medication, safely get her stability and through CPS, and then she confirms again that she wants to get on the sublocate and another observed dose visit is set. She answers the call for the telehealth visit, um, and she sounds surprised. Uh, simply that there's a call and um, acknowledge the visit. She'd be on, the link is sent, and several calls later, uh, no arrival, does not log in. Uh, message is left, no follow-up, no answer to follow visit, and her results return from the urine test. And the urine done prior to the observed dose is on the top, and you can see buprenorphine at very high levels. Norbuprenorphine is negative, and naloxone is at very high levels. And then the oral swab taken after her observed dose, which was with the unwrapped buprenorphine. Um, and you can see the results. Um, and I'm wondering what your interpretation of this is, Dr. Poland. Um, my heart goes out to the whole group. I mean, especially this patient, it sounds like she's really had a, a difficult run of things and, and engaging her has been uh, hard and uh, at best. And so, I mean, but I just have to think when I have these situations that at some part of this person wants to get into treatment because she keeps coming back 
And that I think is, is a kernel of promise that sometimes we miss in, in a situation where somebody is struggling as much of this individual. Well, it, it looks like, unfortunately, she was placing a strip of buprenorphine naloxone into her urine cup and not that was not a metabolite. There's no metabolite of buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine in her urine and the naloxone level is quite high. Um, and then in her oral cavity, it looks like there are some other opiates um, also in there indicating that she may also, she is also has an, uh, another source other than buprenorphine for opioids. Right, exactly. Um, patient does not answer the calls from the provider. She schedules an appointment with a local clinic known to simply prescribe monthly prescriptions without monitoring or check-ins. Um, she's intermittently connecting to counseling and to the peer about one out of three visits, which is satisfying CPS for the counselor and is ongoing team meetings to discuss options. Um, at this point, Sublocate is not offered because of the kind of disconnect with medication. Um, and she was offered to stabilize a detox or inpatient um, and then get the shot, but that um, wasn't followed through. Um, uh, just a little bit about specimen validity testing. Um, Dr. Nelson, um, in particular with regards to this test, which was um, a, a separate test, what, what constitutes specimen validity testing in, for urine and oral drug test specimens? I mean, you're uh, largely what you're seeing at the bottom of this, um, of this screen, you're looking at things that can include temperature, as well as some of the testing that you can do like pH and dilution that would look at things like, um, like specific gravity. Um, I mean, in her case, they, they're actually fairly generous with their ranges, uh, if you ask me, because her, her specific gravity is extraordinarily low, um, below what you would expect most people, I think, um, to be at the, at the lower end of the, um, of the spectrum. Her creatinine is very low, implying that she's diluted her urine. Uh, the pH is in an okay range. Um, so you could really ask whether or not this is a valid specimen based on this alone. Yeah, so you hit on okay. points of temperature, creatinine, grav specific gravity, gravity pH, um, markers that the urine is valid and or, or didn't um, get diluted. Um, there's different ways that we could get into discuss, but um, for the lack of time, um, you know, we want to make sure a specimen is truly a good specimen. And oral sal saliva, there's IgG that um, is sometimes used as a marker um, that a valid test was obtained. Um, we have a really brief case to different results by matrix. The oral fluid doesn't match the urine. Um, this involves a 27-year-old female with opioid and stimulant use disorder is struggling with cocaine while being prescribed buprenorphine. CPS is involved. She had a significant other um, that assaulted her, although they withdrew charges. Both agreed to enter treatment. The three-year-old autistic son lives with mother. Um, significant other is staying with at the house. Patient wants to demonstrate she's doing well. The CPS is asking to come on site to do urine screens despite the COVID-19 limitations. And we've already discussed some of the exceptions that um, we've made for on-site visits. And, you know, this would be a very valid exception you know, with PPE and the right protocol to bring in. Um, again, some other examples that I've included and we've discussed. Uh, patient reports she's doing well, missing, although she's missing counseling sessions and there's been a couple of more police reports. The urine from the first on-site visit show um, no illicit substances and she's got uh, a little bit low norbuprenorphine and creatinine ratio, but she's taking buprenorphine. Um, after learning of the police visit, um, another on-site screen is done and this time uh, the uh, oral testing is also done um, as the clinic is also rolling out an oral testing protocol via telehealth. So a, a, an ability to do oral testing remotely through a secure process. And um, you know, this is a, again, a discrepancy with the urine to the oral and she admits that she'd been bringing in urine to avoid trouble with CPS, but it was just that time though um, we've already covered the the you know the utility of oral versus um, urine screens and um, Dr. Sullivan, you can this is I think one of my final questions. Um, what are your what is your experience with remote drug testing and um, you, you had success with uh, secure oral saliva testing protocols? Yeah, so we um, actually wrote a, a protocol here at uh, Helio Outpatient where uh, we use a um, 
a lab company, we've, we've, we've been able to send oral swabs to uh, patients um, at home in, in the discrete packaging. Um, the first to tell you that, you know, I, I care, but I really don't care. Uh, I, I use, I tell everybody that the, the drug screening release for um, conversation to make sure patients are okay, to see if there's anything more we can do with them. You know, we, I, we never discharge anybody ever, you know, based on drug screening. Um, and it's just, I really want to make sure people are okay. So, you know, we always preface it with that saying, we just want to make sure you're okay. You know, so we, we try to avoid some of this test manipulation things, but um, we don't do it, you know, every week, maybe once a month, just to get an idea of if people are doing okay. So they have a discrete package sent to their home. It doesn't say like drug screen on it or whatnot. And we let people know they might get a couple of them throughout the months or year, and we want them to do them. Um, at first we tried to do it like on video. And then I decided that I don't know the utility of having to watch them. And we, you know, we instill some trust and we let them do it uh, after the first time on their own when they get the kit and they send it back to the lab and then we get the results. Someone will say, well, what's stopping them from, you know, doing something? Well, there are different ways to maybe um, alter saliva tests, although I think they're not like that used to be, you know, they used to talk about people putting baking soda in their mouth or milk and all this stuff. And I don't know how truly this stuff is, but you know, um, if you have a lab that also tests for other medications that patients are on, uh, in addition to the buprenorphine and the metabolites, you, you know, you tend to not get um, too many samples that are, um, you know, from somebody else because there's, you know, or uh, tampered with. So, you know, the hardest thing is that in this time of COVID is, you know, getting people to do it. And because we're open and upfront, we tell people, hey, there's no repercussion to having positive negatives. You know, um, the uptake of the actual system is a tough thing. Um, we were looking at it for about 50% participation, um, you know, getting samples back. We're slowly moving up now towards 30%, and we have thousands of outpatients. So um, we think that we're doing um, decent with it. We'd like to just, you know, do a little bit better because we want to make sure, see how people are doing. And maybe it ends up being, wow, you know, someone's really, maybe you are struggling, you know. Maybe we can then set them up with a peer or talk to them on the phone more, um, you know. Do you need a different support or detox or inpatient? But um, we really do it to just make sure that we're, um, you know, giving the patient what they need to be as, as safe as they can be. Some some great points, and you know, other areas, sports, athletics, and NCAA, I believe, Olympic athletes have really, you know, this is a protocol that's been tested in other areas. But again, comments about it's a piece of the information, not the be all end all. Um, we're really um, coming to the end of the time, I just wanted to comment that, so again, our, the clinic that, that um, this patient's at is rolling it out and we'll use it in the same way that you kind of described. I've got the final slide. Um, I've been ending with um, a poem. I think that this is kind of fitting given everybody the stress. And so I just want everybody to listen. This is from Richard Brodigan. Uh, uh, some call him a beat poet, but re really not quite appropriately just a beat poet. 1935, the died of a uh, suicide, 1984, called Karma Repair Kit Items 1 to 4. Karma Repair Kit Items 1 to 4. One, get enough food to eat and eat it. Two, find a place to sleep where it is quiet and sleep there. Three, reduce intellectual and emotional noise until you arrive at the silence of yourself and listen to it. Four. I wanna thank everybody for attending. Um, thank you panelists for participating today. We had some great discussion. We will have summaries of the cases uh, or the cases and um, some of the key questions that um, will be embedded at the ACMT website and um, available. Please complete the uh, uh, questionnaires and surveys. We really do take a look at that and um, for content and feedback on the presentation. Mark your calendars for the next uh, Friday Addiction, Med, uh, Addiction Toxicology Case Conference on January 8th. This one will focus on the emergency department hospital initiation of buprenorphine and bridging and um, uh, particular uh, pertinent area with a lot of um, interest. So thank you all for attending and um, have a great weekend and stay safe.